<laughs> you are watching Bear Ministries. A new world order can emerge, a new era. Bush kept said, and it's a phrase that I often use myself, that we needed a new world order. And, and one of the ways it will drive the change is through global governance and global... Now much has been said by the Secretary of State and others about a new world order, about a defining moment in history. And interdependent world order might be built. We'll not be here for open for too long. The great seal of the United States. And that great seal of the United States has on it Novus Order Seclorum, a new order for the centuries, for the ages, forever. The climate conference in Copenhagen is another step towards the global management of our planet. The time because you really need to bring China into the creation of a new uh, 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 world order, financial world order. Uh, a, uh, a new world order. To get ahead, we've got to give them a stake in creating the kind of uh, uh, world order that I think all of us would like to see. Yeah. We've got to be very strong, very, very smart, and we've got to come together, not only as a nation, but as a world community. And by looking at this passage, the Apostle Paul is a writer and he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm. New world order. That's what we need now. A new world order with but our topic is going to be on what was variously referred to in the scriptures as the signs of the times or uh, the time of the end or the last days. And we're going to do it by comparing scripture first with contemporary events and seeing if there is some kind of synchronization that's going on. Because it is my contention, in fact, I would say my personal belief, that we're looking at events in our world that are moving us towards what the Bible said would be the events of those last times. In fact, I would go so far to say I do not believe there have been another time in human history where that could be said with more confidence than today. This thing that we've been talking about with the Antichrist and the Mark of the Beast, uh, one world government, one world economy, you write about this in your book. It's taught about in, in, in the Word of God, is it not? It is, yeah. Revelation chapter 13 really is the entry point, I like to say, to this one world government, this one world economy uh, that the Bible predicts. It says that one man is going to ultimately rule the world for the last three and a half years of this, of this current age. And we can see how that can happen. I mean, people today are looking for someone with answers. Now, I like to go back to uh, you know, the time in Weimar, Germany, when the hyperinflation took place, and they were looking for someone to come and to bring some, some, some order from the chaos, and that's how they ended up with Adolf Hitler. That's right. It's the same thing in our world today. As we, I think as we see more economic chaos and nations in chaos, people are going to be looking for a savior and a deliverer. And then the ability to uh, exchange through the internet that you can purchase, and then uh, the, the global aspect of our economy, our credit cards, online banking, it all just seems to fit into the biblical narrative of, of the ancients, uh, this modern technology. It does, and the Bible never tells us this end time economy will be cashless but I believe it has to be in, or, in order to control it. Because as long as there's money, you can buy on the black market and kind of get around the yeah. system. But you can't buy or sell, the Bible says, unless you have this mark of the beast, this identifying mark of the Antichrist. And 
To me, the only way for that to happen is it's all his control. With the executive branch, because otherwise it doesn't work. So you got to eliminate that compliance and you make it a mandate. Um, and then you do training, particularly in the city, I'll call them licensing departments, whether it's zoning, buildings, um, housing will be impacted by it, planning certainly. Um, and, it's, and, you, and you pick the people that run those agencies and the deputies that are pledging allegiance to the new world order and good governance. And then I think you have the inspector general do some spot audits to make sure they're pledging allegiance to the new world order and good governance. think the world is going to be a better place next year, in the next decade? Can we end hunger, achieve gender equality, halt climate change, all in the next 15 years? Well, according to the governments of the world, yes, we can. In the last few days, the leaders of the world meeting at the UN in New York agreed a new set of global goals for the development of the world to 2030. And here they are. These goals are the product of a massive consultation exercise. The global goals are who we, humanity, want to be. Now that's the plan, but can we get there? Can this vision for a better world really be achieved? Well, I'm here today because we've run the numbers, and the answer, <laughs> shockingly, is that maybe we actually can. Robert, Robert well, Wilson. Congratulations. Robert Wilson. Well, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I'm a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Is and that a conspiracy? You, well, you've certainly... Well, it, Let me just tell you what Newsweek says, that, says this. The John Birch Society considers communism only one arm of a, national, of a master conspiracy in which socialist American insiders are plotting to establish world government. Now, he also says, and here's Director John McManus, that's your public relations director, saying that former Secretary of State Alexander Haig and CIA Director William Casey are two of these master conspirators who are plotting to establish world government. Now, what do you say? You know, that kind of silly, asinine statement is what makes, pe makes people laugh at the John Birch Society. Well, Tom, I'm sure being a long-standing member of the Rockefeller apparatus uh, and as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations of long-standing, you're fully aware that you, there is an elitist core in the country that has seen value in subsidizing communism or protecting communism. It has? Sure. You're accusing me of subsidizing communism? No, no, I'm saying because that there I happen is, to belong no, to a, no, to there a is an elite core. study group? That, no, no, wait a minute. There is an elite core in this country that has dominated American society. Well, I'm not one of them. Trilateral Commission. A Trilateral Council Commission, on Council on Foreign Relations. State Department, I suppose. 
Well, let's face it, they've dominated the State Department for 40 years, and uh, pretty much openly All right, so. but what are they trying to do? Kind well, of their about? objective is to try to bring about a gradual transition in our society, a dissolving of sovereignty, and a moving steadily to the left on the political spectrum. Well, who are the they? Belief, the elitist groups that I mentioned, particularly key individuals and policymakers in the Council of Foreign Relations. Is the International Monetary Fund part of this? Well, I would say the International Monetary Fund has certainly been set up for the purpose of facilitating that transfer of sovereignty and transfer of wealth on the road. All right, we elected Mr. Conservative. Let me just finish the point, right. because otherwise we're going to have a lot of un unanswered questions, that you are looking at a group that has worked to bring about the dissolution of national sovereignty on the road to world government. And certainly uh, you're familiar with the local professor, Carol Quigley, who has been part of your club, in which he admitted all this. And he said in his book, Tragedy and Hope, the only thing I disagree is that we've worked to keep it a secret. And you see Arthur Schlesinger, Jr., writing way back in 1947, says, yes, this is the hidden policy of America. But we can't tell the American public because they're too unsophisticated to see the who, value. What is the instrumentality of world government? What is like the instrumentality of All the things which you say about Arthur Schlesinger, that's the silliest statement I ever heard. He well, never made anything like well, that. Well, let me suggest that you read the May-June issue of the Partisan Review of 1947, Tom, and you can read it for yourself. It's called well, Arthur Schlesinger said there was a conspiracy. Oh. A conspiracy oh, to he promote didn't use communism? The word. Oh, no, he didn't use the word conspiracy. I he said the objective was to bring about... Well, well, let me finish. I'll, I'll tell you. He said that the objective, the secret policy, which we can't tell the American public because they're not sophisticated enough to see the value, is that through a steady result of erosion of new deals, we bring the American society steadily to the left, All right. and through a sound concept of benign containment, we merge into the vital center of the socialist left. Those are his words, not mine. All right. Mr. Speaker, the Pope of the Holy See. The Pope of the Holy See? What a moment. Of course, the Pope is coming to the Congress today as a head of state. To answer what is world government, it seems that there's a concerted effort to bring the governments under one elitist control, uh, consolidation or centralized government, so to speak. And I believe that this is what is called the New World Order. This is the one world government that has been proposed for a long time through all the ages through secret societies. We get the indication from Freemasonic writer Manly P. Hall, a prolific writer. If you are a skeptic in matters of astrology, you will probably ask for concrete proof that astrological predictions have actually been made. These old books are the proof of such authority in the lodges that there is a secret destiny of America in which to bring the world under a world government using America as the headquarters. This came about with the Rosicrucians through Francis Bacon, author of New Atlantis, which became a model for this plan. What is truth, said Jest in private, and would not stay for an answer? Certainly there be the delight it gives, and count it a bondage to fix a belief. Uh, giving the sort of model from the Atlantean race of this philosophy of Atlantis and the entities that died and are spiritually elected spiritual realm to give guidance and, and to summon them as ascended masters under this belief called theosophy, which is a different uh, group who governs some people in world government as well, under Lucius Trust and uh, the, uh, the educational systems there. But we ask who's behind this, and we have to say it's 
those within networks, secret societies, having occult knowledge, occult groups like the Golden Dawn and the esoteric secret groups that are offshoots of mysticism, Kabbalah, and uh, different philosophies fused together. Initiates of a section of the mysteries of Egypt, which is called the Resurrection Order of Alpha Omega, assist me to blow the hole in the grave of Neophyte in the heart of Temple Number Seven in Paris. Take cover, keep hidden, and get ready to infiltrate a super secret organization. The society includes at least three U.S. presidents, Supreme Court justices, and too many senators and CEOs to name. It's an organization with a history spanning over 150 years, shrouded in mystery and retaining some pretty unique and fascinating secrets. Even though their identities were known, what they did inside the tomb was still supposed to be top secret. Number five. Lots of powerful elite or bonesmen. Chris, welcome to the Skull and Bones Society. This is where the most powerful men in the world are groomed for their futures. Conspiracy theorists love discussing the Skull and Bones, especially how many important, influential, and powerful members have passed through its doors. You know, he's an ambitious man. The idea of getting the Supreme Court is the only thing he really loves. Members of this super-secret organization are known as Bonesmen and have included Senator John Kerry, former President William Howard Taft, and three generations of the Bush family, including George W. Bush, George Bush Sr., and Prescott Bush. But more on him later. Other Bonesmen have gone on to head multi-million dollar corporations or otherwise become power players on the world stage, leading to much speculation that the society is meant to breed future world leaders and other men of influence. We share similar backgrounds, you and I, and I hope similar values which could put this society's influence to better use. You know, someone I loved once told me that if it's secret and elite, it can't be good. And I think governed from the top, from Illuminate groups, they call them the Illuminati. Illuminati is actually a reference to the Bavarian Illuminati under Adam Weishaupt, who founded it in 1776 to raise up a network of elitists called Intellects, under his group, the Perfectibilists, in order to rule sectors of society and get all the world in compliance with this new world order by Rothschild financing. But it grasped all the secret societies and bloodlines that were worthy to include them in world banking, world government and positions of power and politics and such to lead towards this one world philosophy and even the families, wealthy families such as Rockefellers had to play in this with their influence of wealth through the, the uh, takeover of oil industry with their influence on the medical associations and their philanthropy of giving to colleges in hopes to help in education, but their actual intent and purpose was to govern the colleges and universities with their philosophies by inserting their own CEOs in place of high positions. Chanting and squealing inside. Who controls the British crown? Who keeps the metric system down? We do. We do. And conspiracy theories. Because so much organized crime uses the Masonic secret system and the good old boy network to be able to get away with murder. And I mean murder. Welcome to the world of Freemasonry. I'd give anything to get into the stone cutters. What do they do there, Dad? I'm a member. What do they do? 
don't they do? Coming through. Can't throw me out. My father's a member. I'm in. I'm in. Okay, okay, homie, you're in. Just don't point that thing at me. Oh, thanks, Lenny. When am I going to be initiated? As soon as number one gets here. Number one? <laughs> what kind of stupid wiener name is that? <laughs> Hello, my name is number one. Is he the leader? Of this chapter. There are chapters all over the world. And it has been foretold that someday a chosen one will... Okay, okay. Then it... Welcome to the club number 908. You have joined the sacred order of the stonecutters, who since ancient times have split the rocks of ignorance that obscure the light of knowledge and truth. What is one world government? When you look at the history of the entire uh, one world movement, the idea of a, a one world system, uh, it is part of the overall plan for a new world order. Uh, one person properly described it as a one world government inside a new world order because of the, the new world order is bigger uh, than just world government. World government is a part of what uh, to expect with the new world order. New World Order changed the entire fabric, uh, or an attempt uh, to change the entire fabric uh, of society or of the world system, uh, as it were, you could say, uh, the way in which society is ran and everything. And one of those things that they want to change, they want to eliminate uh, nation, nationhood. They want to eliminate the nation state. This concept of building a one world government uh, actually is, uh, this is something many people miss, uh, it is a religious concept. It's a religious concept. It's a religious uh, ideology, you could say. Uh, that is the glue. Once you, when you begin to look into these things, you begin to look into the conspiracy that's pushing this and everything, once you understand that this is the glue that binds, that kind of ties everything together, then it, it helps you understand, because it's hard to understand the relentless pursuit these people have. This has been generations in the making, hundreds of years pushing hard, really longer, uh, some would say longer than that, but the hard push, at least going back about 150 to 200 years. Um, you can understand it a little better when you understand that the glue that binds everybody together is an ideology. It's an ideology. The ultimate goals are the world's action plan for a fair globalization and a better future for all. We have 10 years to bring that vision to life, and we can only get there together. That is why we have launched a decade of action to deliver the goals, to overcome poverty and inequality, to combat the climate crisis and advance gender equality, to build peaceful, just and inclusive societies free of discrimination and hate in harmony with nature. Join us, step up, seize the moment, and let us work together to meet the goals, move our world forward, and leave no one behind. To control the population, you have to control the people messaging the population. Some of these stars have 20, 30 million followers. That's more followers than CNN, Fox, ABC, NBC. These people have to be controlled. They can't just go off a message and start saying whatever they want to say. They have to be somewhat reined in. They have to be controlled or they do not get the platform to have the voice that they have. If you're willing to be part of their secret society or if you're compromised, they will not let someone obtain a lot of fame in po and power if they can't control you. A classic example, at least for me, is Katy Perry. Katy Perry was, was a gospel singer, very talented, uh, but she was going nowhere. And she got up to Hollywood and, and basically they said, you want to be a success? You play by our rules. You step into the occult and you start putting that in your videos. And now she's doing videos with her in hell with satanic themes and she's what? highly successful a pyramid a lot we see the evil one eye constantly it's always on the cover of magazines we see these are supposed to be the six 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 devil symbols we constantly see those symbols 
But today we are living in a world where literally the idea of one universal governs the planet is not only a possibility, it is a program that's being worked very earnestly by a lot of powerful and influential people, as you'll see. Go crazy for the incredible Jennifer Hudson. Actor and activist Leonardo DiCaprio. Y'all ready? You're a sky, cause you're a sky full of stars We can be. We must be. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequalities. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how it will get done. The global goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere. With no one left behind. We, we will live in a world where nobody anywhere lives in extreme poverty. Where no one goes hungry. Where no one wakes in the morning asking if there will be food today. We will live in a world where no child has to die from diseases we know how to cure. And where proper health care is a lifelong right for us all. We will live in a world where everyone goes to school. And education gives us the knowledge and skills for a fulfilling life. We will live in a world where all girls and all women have equal opportunities to thrive and be powerful and safe. We cannot succeed if our world is held back. We will live in a world where all people can get clean water and proper toilets at home, at school, and at work. We will live in a world where there is sustainable energy for everyone. Heat, light, and power for the whole planet without destroying the planet. We will live in a world where economies prosper. A new wealth leads to decent jobs for everyone. And we will live in a world where our industry our infrastructure and our best innovations are not just used to make money but to all make all our, our lives better. better. We live in a world where prejudices and extremes of inequality are defeated inside our countries and between different countries. Where people live in cities and communities that are safe, progressive, and support everyone who lives there. Where we replace what we consume, planet where we put back what we take out of the earth. We live in a world that is decisively rolling back the threat of climate, climate change. change. Where we restore and protect the, the life in our, our oceans, oceans and seas. We <laughs> restore and protect life on land. The forests, animals, the earth itself. With peace between and inside countries. Where all governments are open. And answer to us for what they do at home and abroad. And the justice rules. With everyone equal before the law. Where all countries and we their people work together in partnerships of all kinds to make these global goals, goals a reality for everyone, everywhere. These are the United Nations global goals for sustainable development. Let's, Let's get, get to work. work. Let's make it happen. In the year 2015, the world agreed on the ambitious, inclusive and universal sustainable development goals, making a commitment to leave no one behind. It is so decided. Just a few months later, we are already seeing those promises transform into first concrete steps for action. On 21st of April, presidents, prime ministers and other high-level representatives from around the world gathered at the UN headquarters in New York for a high-level debate on achieving the SDGs now that the goals and targets have been set. We have no time to waste. It's now time to turn this agreement into policies and action, into laws and budget lines. Also on hand were several of the SDG advocates prominent members of various segments of the society from government, business sector, entertainment, sports and culture, whose mission is to raise awareness for the SDGs and spur public into action towards their implementation. 
I think that these goals are really truly a blueprint for, for how we can deal with the needs of our society and of the world. I find this the chance for this generation. Clear goals, moral basis, good ethics, combining economic prosperity, social justice, and environmental sustainability. Our collective commitment to the 17 Sustainable Development Goals is our most important defense in ensuring the benefits of our modernizing world are shared among all nations and among all people, and not just the privileged few. These are not goals about poor countries. There is still a long way to go to really achieve sustainable development, whether you're in a rich country or a poor country. There's no way we can talk about sustainable goals with all concrete actions about what is happening, not just in our world, but also on the continent that I come from. All of these things are touching us. All, all nations are involved in this. And unless we deal with that, unless we all come together, we won't be able to solve the problems of our own country because we haven't solved the problems of the other. We need first to take seriously the goals because these are the world's goals. They're the only goals we're gonna have for our generation. It is the world I always am looking to see is a world that, that is filled with a lasting peace. Prominent members of various segments of the society from government, business sector, entertainment, sports and culture, whose mission is to raise awareness for the SDGs and spur public into action towards their implementation. Goals to take part in global development through on and offline activism. Each action taken earns reward points for major events and your favorite artists. Every year this kind of, I guess, mixture between prop and policy comes together and we see that the, the action button is the next evolution in our journey. You ever wonder what 60,000 people trying to change the world sounds like? Hello Global Citizen! The next year and a half will shape the future of humanity and our planet. Progress we need will only be possible if folks like you continue to take action. Are you with us? Together we can achieve a world where she is equal. The climate youth movement is more important than at any time in human history. And speaking of Mother Earth, let's rock it! Education is the key to unlocking a better world for all of us. Future generations deserve a world free from AIDS, TB, and malaria, and we can make that happen. There was a time all the people of the world spoke the same language and used the same words. As the people migrated to the east, they found a plain in the land of Babylonia and settled there. They began saying to each other, let's make bricks and harden them with fire. Then they said, come, let's build a great city for ourselves with a tower that reaches into the sky. We will make a name for ourselves which will keep us from being scattered all over the world. But the Lord came down to look at the city and the tower the people were building. Look, said the Lord, the people are united and they all speak the same language. After this, nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse the people with different languages. Then they won't be able to understand each other. The Lord did this because of the pride in the people's heart and their disobedience of the Lord's instructions to spread out over the earth. In that way, the Lord scattered them all over the world and they stopped building the city. So the city became known as Babel because that is where the Lord confused the people with different languages. In this way, he scattered them all over the world. The Tower of Babel, the subject of one of the strangest stories in the Bible. But could it be based on truth? I thought as a kid this was 
folklore or legend. And then a lot of people still think of it in biblical terms as some kind of legend, but they don't really know that it actually existed. I'm really at the place where the tower stood. The fragile remains of the legendary city of Babylon in modern-day Iraq have revealed many secrets. The greatest of all was the discovery of a vast structure that ancient records suggest was the Tower of Babel. Ancient texts have allowed experts to imagine what the building might have looked like. But now, astounding new evidence has emerged. Inscribed on the surface of a privately owned tablet is an image that sensationally reveals exactly what the Tower of Babel looked like. This is a very strong piece of evidence that the Tower of Babel story in the Bible was inspired by this real building. This remarkable tablet, which has never been filmed before, dates to the 6th century BC. It was discovered in Babylon over a century ago. Unbelievably, no one realized how important it was until Professor Andrew George, an expert in ancient texts, brought its faint carvings back to life. At the top here, this part, there is a relief uh, depicting a step tower. And here, a great a figure of a human being carrying a staff with a conical hat on. Below that relief is a text which has been chiseled into the monument and uh, the label is easily read. It, it reads Atem and Anki, Zikurat Babylon. And that means the Zikurat or Temple Tower of the city of Babylon. This tablet provides the first ever image of the real Tower of Babel. It confirms the building was a Mesopotamian stepped tower and illustrates the seven tiers of the ancient megastructure. Significantly, it also clearly identifies the man behind it, Mesopotamia's most famous ruler, King Nebuchadnezzar II. Man behind it, Mesopotamia's most famous ruler, builder, King uh, Nebuchadnezzar the same, uh, the II. But while the, the images are extraordinary, uh, the, the same, tablet's uh, ancient text belief. also reveals a detailed account of the tower's construction. And more importantly, how Nebuchadnezzar went about building it. It reads from the upper sea, which is the Mediterranean, to the lower sea, and that's the Persian Gulf. The far-flung lands and teeming people of the habitations I mobilized in order to construct this building of the Ziggurat of Babylon. Incredibly, this ancient account is identical to the biblical story of how the Tower of Babel was constructed. For scholars, the tablet offers further proof that the Tower of Babel wasn't just a work of fiction. It was an actual building from antiquity. How do we know when it is forming and when it is here? Ever since the ages, throughout the ages, man has anticipated the coming of this king kingdom and its antichrist ruling over nations. During the time of the Reformation, it was apparent that the Pope and the papacy of Vatican would be the opposing force against the reformers, against the people of God. And even the, the Roman Catholic Church raised up their militant army, known as the Jesuits, that would lead the counter-reformation against the Reformation to rein in those that were dissident from the Catholic Church. But the King of England also rivaled the Catholic Church with his form of religion through the Church of England. As he wanted to be a representation of God on earth on the throne of the kingdoms of Europe. While the Pope and the Vatican were noted as the Antichrist, even the King of England could have been considered a dominant dictator and ruler over religion under his auspices. But at that time, even the Puritans would think that world government was there and the Antichrist was present through the papacy or maybe even through the king, and they thought their time was now. 
But even back in Paul's day, in 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we see how people were concerned with the end times that they had missed the catching up of the saints. And Paul assured them they didn't miss it. And he further went on in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 that before that day was at hand, they would see the falling away, the apostasy, which means falling from that which he had, which would indicate that it was a fallen church, and that they would see the man of sin, the son of perdition, who would oppose and exalt himself above all that is called of God, that is worshipped, as if he is God, sitting on the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Perhaps we're even going to see a further technology tampering with human biological uh, properties, DNA, editing, and especially the allowed perversions, homosexuality and such, that the Bible warns against. And Jesus said these days will look like the days of Noah. So the, all these signs would be known first. That's how we'll know when it's here. Until then, it's mainly speculation and interpretation, as we have many interpretations of what it would look like, who it could be, if it's one particular person, how he would govern, what he would come out of, his character, and also what his mark would be, which is told about in Revelation 13, with the mark of the beast. We can only speculate whether it be a chip, a tattoo, a thought, labor for the beast system, compliance with the beast system, or even as some would suggest in the Seventh-day Adventist that it's the worship of church on Sunday, which I find the law to be the governing factor not to, to be valid. But one thing's for sure, it's not going to sneak up on people to accidentally take this mark to give in to the beast. It will be a known volunteer and I believe willful compliance towards that. And the internet of things and Agenda 2030 is most likely going to be the catalyst. We are very honored to have with us today the next speaker, the state secretary of, to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Annika Söder. Welcome her with a big hand. Very happy to have been asked to speak not only about wiki gaps and gender equality, but also about the 2030 agenda, the sustainable uh, development goals. And this is of course of key importance as we all know, because we live in this area of fake news at all levels. And we need to be brave because this has become an uphill battle. Uh, and uh, if civil society uh, and free media will not be allowed not only to exist, but also to uh, make progress and spread. Uh, uh, if civil if society, civil society uh, uh, and free, and free media, media will not will be, not be allowed, allowed not only not to, only exist, to exist, exist, but also but to, to, to uh, make, uh, make progress, progress and spread and I think we are all uh, in a very, very difficult uh, situation. Starting in 1900, we entered a previously unimaginable time of modern technology. Advances that allowed the rulers of this world to construct and direct our stories in ways we previously never imagined. As a result, new techniques to control the population were realized. These are the people from the companies that we have trusted to deliver us our news and tell our stories. This has always been about controlling what we as the population think and hear. They help create our culture and influence our society. We as citizens only trust them because as a society, we think that the gatekeepers have our best interests in mind. The dangerous, you know, edges here are that he's trying to undermine the media, trying to make up his own facts, and it could be that while unemployment and uh, the, the economy worsens, he could have undermined the messaging so much that he can actually control right. uh, exactly what people think. And that if, is the that is our you, job. Yeah, that is if our you look job. At the issue, that is if, our job. If, our job. As I was researching 
I found that most of the early communication companies were developed for shipping or aviation. And a lot of the men that started these companies were commissioned by the military during World War I and World War II. Many of these men worked for the Army and Navy Intelligence Services along with the OSS, which we know became the CIA. There were many examples of these men becoming the heads or founders of some of the biggest motion picture and media companies before and after their government or military service. I wanted to know if how many of the media companies in today's world connected back to Washington. So I started looking. It was like a family tree. The connections between our government personnel and the media corporations was unbelievable. Google, Amazon, Netflix, Twitter, CNN, ABC. So what would happen if all these companies had the same political ideology or agenda? The news in the United States by channeling it through some foreign country. And we're looking at that very carefully. And that continues today? Well, I, yeah, I would think probably for a reporter it would continue today, but because of all of the revelations of the period of the 1970s, uh, it seems to me that a reporter's got to be much more circumspect in doing it now, or he runs the risk of uh, at least being looked at with considerable disfavor by the public. I think you've got to be much more careful about it. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 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 As I did my research, I began to understand there's a very small group of people that influence all the companies that we watch. So they used to call them the big six. But Disney just bought Fox, and Disney controls Marvel, and Disney owns Lucas Studios. So look at that giant audience right here. Say a small group of people control the narratives and the content that we all see on all the channels. It makes you feel like, oh, I have lots of choices, but you don't. Who's telling them what to put on? What they're wanting to do, and this this was written in a, in a, in a document uh, put out by the Club of Rome in the 70s. What they're wanting to do is they're wanting to divide the world into economic and political blocks. Ironically, uh, they're wanting to divide them into 10 of them. Now, this is where, this is where, if you know anything about Bible prophecy, your ears ought to pop up. Because why 10? Why 10? Some would say, and I, you know, don't quote me on this. They say, that I believe they said the Atlantean Empire had 10 regions. When you look at occultism on a whole, where they would say, okay, this is, this is duality at play. And really all of these organizations that you're referring to uh, work together. So they, this, this could be a connection there, but from a biblical perspective, this, is, this, this ought to make our ears go up because uh, when we look at it, when we look at the biblical perspective, it talks about in the end times how there will be a, a 10 kings that will, you know, when this world system comes into being, there will be 10 kings ruling it. And Antichrist will rise among the 10 kings. See, that's one thing people need to realize. The Bible does not prophesy. The Bible does not prophesy that there will be an Antichrist and he will establish the one world system. If you study the Bible uh, closely, it does not say that. The Bible prophesies an Antichrist that will come, will rise to power when the final world empire is in place. Study Daniel chapter 7. This also gives us an implication, shows us an implication of something. And that is a group of people are going to start this. Not one man. Did you know that the prophetic dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel chapter 2 could have potential implications for us today? The dream featured a huge statue of a man whose splendor was excellent and its form was awesome. And the head of the statue was of gold, its chest and arms of silver, 
Its belly and thighs are bronze. Its legs of iron. And its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Each section represented a kingdom. And the head of gold was one of those kingdoms of Babylon, ruled by Nebuchadnezzar himself. The second section, the chest and arms of silver, was to be a second inferior kingdom, which we are told in Daniel 5 was the Media Persian Empire. The third kingdom, the belly and thighs of bronze, was Greece, ruled by Alexander the Great. And the fourth kingdom, the legs of iron, was undoubtedly Rome. The fifth kingdom, however, is the feet of iron and clay. And that is the kingdom that will be smashed by the rock, bringing down all the other kingdoms before it. Daniel 2, 34. Now, while opinions differ on who this last empire is, most Christians believe that this is to be the Antichrist kingdom, the final kingdom, which is spoken of in Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. Here, the Antichrist leads a coalition of 10 nations, which is in verse 14 is defeated by Christ, who then sets up his eternal kingdom, where the kingdoms of the world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, Revelation 11, 15. Jesus said there will be signs to help us identify the time of the end and of his return. We can rely on the prophetic picture of the statue in Daniel to tell us what the nature of this last kingdom will be partly strong with attributes of the Iron Kingdom, of Rome for example, and yet with clear weaknesses that come from a divided kingdom. Does this sound familiar? Our hope is secure though, as the book of Daniel in chapter 2 verse 44 finishes this particular prophecy with these words. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of a mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. The implications to us in this generation is that we are in that last ruling power and we need to be aware that Christ's kingdom is soon to come. I tend to agree that at the top, again, you have a group, a priesthood, if you will, controlling everything, but mostly it has continued this tradition. Uh, has been elite bloodlines. Uh, it's been passed down through bloodlines. Um, there are popular bloodlines that are known today, um, but when you look at some of the uh, more popular ones today, you look at the Rothschilds, the Collins family, the Rockefellers, uh, different ones like that that have that have uh, ascended to the heights you know, of power uh, or, or have been in power now for quite some time. Uh, when you look at this entire system, you also see you also see some faces now that are, because there's always a struggle for dominance, the, the hierarchy structure. So you see people that are rising to prominence. You see people like George Soros. George Soros, public enemy George number Soros, one. the greatest speculator George of the Soros world. amassed around a billion dollars that day, speculating on supporting anti-communist dissident The man activity. who broke the back. The name George Soros crops up in the news a lot. He's called Brexit an immensely damaging process and has given about £800,000 to pro-Remain. He's pretty unpopular in certain corners of Twitter, where he's at the centre of just about every conspiracy theory. Hungary's Prime Minister is one of Soros' fiercest critics. When the murder of a journalist in neighbouring Slovakia prompted anti-government protests there, this is how Viktor Orban responded. Soros György és a hozzá hasonló szervezetek a munkáját, illetve annak a kezenyomát a szlovák eseményeken, és egy percig sincsen kétségem a felől, hogy Soros György és a 
vele együttműködők mindent megtesznek, minden alkalmat megragadnak, hogy azokat a kormányokat, amelyek ellenállnak a be. On one side of the duality would, would be hardcore Satanism or even our type of Satanism, on the other side would be Luciferianism, but at the end, all together, it's just one big Satanic system with uh, people at the helm at the top. But the modern plan we see now, I do believe, came from the Bavarian faction. I believe that's what we see at work ourselves. today. When we look out the window and we see this collapse of communism, we see all these countries coming into the open world economy, how large is this opportunity? What is the, what is the number of potential American Express cardholders gotten to? in the last couple of years. This was like in 1994. And they came back to him and said, the number of potential American Express card holders has quadrupled in the last four years. So that doesn't happen every day. That was a once in a lifetime moment when you know, you really had about a hundred countries from around the world, from India, China, Indonesia, all of these countries move lower trade barriers, lower investment, lower investment barriers. And so that, powerful force has continued to move forward. Right? That, that, if you would think about it, there's three engines. One is sort of political stability. The second is globalization, because what happened is everybody then starts to get deeply interdependent, trading with each other, communicating with each other. Um, and it, it's a much different globalization than anybody had ever seen before. Now, see the third story here, which is you were worked all weekend over in D.C. at the IIF uh, highlight. And when we asked you what the highlight was, we wanted to talk about it. You said the new world order. What does that mean? I think we're sitting there with, you know, there's a lot of banking executives, central bankers. At, uh, it was the IIF, Institute of International Finance. So it's the sister of the IMF. You would think banking executives would be talking about performance or, or deals or anything. But it's, it's not really like that there. They were talking about whether the U.S can retain its dominance and what its relationship would like be like with China moving forward. So I, when I'd spoken with Larry Summers, for example, he had said that the erratic behavior of the U.S. is something that could risk the U.S.'s credibility. Mm -hmm. And when the IIF president had asked a bunch of leaders, such as Axel Weber, the UBS chairman, former president of the Bundesbank, whether the U.S. and China would be able to fix their relationships, you literally saw Glenn Hubbard laughing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like, they were <laughs> so nice. Welcome back to The Lead. I'm Jake Tapper. Now it's time for the Barry Lee. That's a story we do not think is getting enough play. When you think of secret societies, you think of groups of rich old men, like Mr. Burns from The Simpsons, sitting around a ridiculously long table, all trying to top each other with their best diabolical laugh. It makes for a fun cartoon, but in reality, such societies and secretive meetings do exist. And one is going on right now behind closed doors in England. The Bilderberg Group is a meeting of the most influential people in Europe and North America. Wall Street investors, business moguls, politicians, royalty, they're all coming together and keeping the media and everyone else out. What are they discussing? What are they plotting? Doesn't the public have a right to know? Well, apparently, no. Though, what they chat about could very well end up impacting your 401k or who knows what else. <laughs> Security was tight today at the Grove Hotel in this leafy area north of London. 140 members of the global elite arrived here for a top-secret, hush-hush, off-the-record conference in the English countryside. How's this for a guest list? The head of the International Monetary Fund, former Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner, the heads of Amazon.com, Google, and BP Oil, former General and CIA Director David Petraeus, and what's a top-secret cabal of puppet masters without Henry Kissinger? All of them came here today for the Bilderberg Conference. That's Bilderberg, not build -a bear Participants are tight-lipped about discussions other than to say topics will range from the economy to jobs to U.S. foreign policy, what the organizers call megatrends and the major issues facing the world. Reporters and outsiders are not allowed in, and everything is off the record. Organizers say that so participants can take time to listen, reflect, and gather insights. Protesters from around the globe have descended upon the venue, objecting to the secret nature of the meetings, which have been going on behind closed doors among European and North American elites since 1954. Protester Daniel Kirby explains. 
It's just a gathering of people who are concerned that our elected politicians who promise transparency are meeting in secret with the heads of top banks, pharmaceutical companies, weapons companies. You, know, you name it, European royalty are in there, sort of thing. Um, it's just, it's just incredible that they can say one thing and do the other. Now, if you're thinking this is just another cabal of the people who secretly run the world, so does noted author, provocateur, and conspiracy theorist Alex Jones from Infowars. Magna Carta has been restricted for the scum globalists that are in there. Jones is broadcasting live from the conference this week as these masters of the universe confab away from cameras. The conference wraps up on Sunday, and organizers say there will be no resolutions or votes and no policy statements. I think it would be very naive to think that all of these people are going to turn up to a meeting unless it has some effect. Gerard Batten is a member of the European Parliament for London. I'm sure, I'm sure that they, they are, are actually are reaching actually decisions, decisions about, about which way public way policy should be going in the countries that are represented and, of course, in the European Union. What can we do to prepare? Well, many think that knowing the truth will set you free. There's a lot of conspiracy sites that reveal what's going on and exposes the agenda. It identifies the culprits, points them out, points fingers at those that are involved in the Luciferian system. But as I tell people, if you know the truth about what they're doing and you're set free by what the knowledge that you have of exposing them and not being willfully enslaved and imprisoned by their system if you don't know Jesus Christ or you have the remedy for your sin the payment for your sin against God you're gonna perish likewise with those Luciferians who you are opposed to in other words they don't know God they're opposed to God but if you don't know Jesus Christ, you're also opposed to God and his offer of Jesus as the final sacrifice for the remission of sin. And you will likewise perish along with the degenerates that we are accusing. What's their end game? Their end game seems to be as the God of this world blinds the eyes of those from the gospel and the glory of Jesus as mentioned in 2 Corinthians 4.4. Satan uh, hopes to not give the offer and the opportunity of salvation. But the Luciferians want to bring about a world government and use this earth, this fallen earth, as their throne and to rule over it. Because they know once it's destroyed, they'll likely be judged. I believe that they will be judged. But I also believe that they can rule, govern, dictate, or plan outside of God's boundaries. So it's in, very important to understand they are given the permissive will of God as Job uh, demonstrated with Satan asking to hurt Job and God gave him a boundary that you can, you can hurt him. But you, so I believe that they do have a sense of knowing what the end game is and they do have a sense of knowing what God has planned but they believe that they can overcome it and rule from it and beat God at his own plan. But they must stay within the means that God has set forth, which is why the principles of the universe also constitute their initiating people and having their willful permission in order to do this. And I believe this is why there is so much of what is called predictive programming, why there are movies, why there are hints to the plan ahead of time before the, the things hit because they must have our initial will involved and they do it subtly and cunningly but the universal principle of telling us what they're going to do first is in play and I believe they have to have permission from God in order to even do that but also invitation by us last part of this, this uh, development of what book, the book of Revelation refers to as the kingdom of the beast. And the word beast there, Therion in Greek, literally means a ferocious, brutal, savage beast. And it's essentially this kingdom that rests upon this universal global governance 
that will have such an impact upon the earth and those who live on it. It was a prophet Daniel who tells us a great deal about the character of this final kingdom that is coming. In fact, and also of its king. And I think most interestingly, he tells us first of all that it will be different from all other kingdoms. And I think that's something that we often gloss over when we read it. But different means you can't look to history or past governmental experiences or systems to understand this one. It's going to stand out and be distinct from everyone, well, everyone else. In fact, Daniel and also Revelation tells us it's going to be a composite or a confederation of ten supra-nations. In other words, not just simply na nation-states, but supra-states. Supra that is, governments and countries that now may have separate boundaries will be bound together in a new kind of organizational hub, not much of it being economic as opposed to being uh, ethnic or anything else that might link people together in cultures today. Basically, it's a government that he says is partly strong and it's partly brittle. And then he says the people will be a mixture and will not remain united. So it's going to be an interesting world where we talk about this multiculturalism, which is so much in vogue in our time today. It's going to be a multicultural collection of people who previously may not have found themselves bound together, but now are bound together by force, by governments, by economics, and to some degree by a universal central religious system. On the problem of evil, problem yeah. of suffering, mm -hmm. a secular philosopher describes it this way. So the Christians believe God is all powerful. Yes. The Christians believe God is all loving. The Christians know there is suffering. This is a trilemma because it is incongruous. How can an all powerful and an all loving God sit back and watch such evil and suffering going on? So he calls it a trilemma. Now, I respond very quickly by saying, why is it a trilemma? because it's also true that God is all wise. We don't end our theology with God is all powerful, all loving and evil exists. We also believe God is all wise. And we further believe that God is eternal. You bring just those two elements into the, into the equation and it changes the paradigm. We know God is all knowing. And then you take the issue of time. What happens over a period of time? Let me give you a quick example of this. When I was growing up in India, I was a constant failure, repeated failure, because I never applied myself. And then all of a sudden I passed at very high honors and the ability to join the Indian Air Force. Honors and the ability to join the Indian Air Force. Out of 300, they were going to select 10. I came in at number three. So I sit down in front of this Chilean looking wing commander and he stares at me across the table and he's asking me a few questions and then he leans over and in Hindi he says, Beta. Beta means son. He said, Beta? good man, you're a nice man, and I'm going to reject you. Just like that. And I, I visibly felt my body start to tremble. He said, this job is about killing, and psychologically you are not equipped to kill. It was a few months after that the opportunity came to my way to Canada. If I'd been accepted into the Indian Air Force, I was committing for about 20 years. I would never have come here. Never would have had the time to sense the call for God into ministry. Never would have seen the life that God has now given to me to be a persuader and uh, help people understand the beauty of the gospel message. That door was slammed. It took years to find out why that door was slammed. There are emotionally satisfying answers as time goes by. I've lived with a lot of pain with a broken back. I have two titanium rods that are about eight inches long, four clamps, eight screws bolting me down. I injured my back very badly. There were times I'd be sitting in the front seat with a car pulling over and my face and I head on my steering wheel and crying. The pain was so intense. And you know what I found? How much it has stopped me to depend on him every day to sustain me. There are two things I need with this lifestyle, a strong back and strong vocal cords, and I have neither. And God has shown me that in my weakness has manifested his strength and how his healing hand even came through on my back after years and years of suffering. 
There is an emotional satisfaction when I know that there is a cross, there is a hill called Calvary, there is a suffering Savior, there is a relationship where He gives me comfort. God does not conquer in spite of the dark mystery of evil. He conquers through it. He conquers through evil and pain and suffering and makes you the person He intended you to be through it. Talitha Kumai, arise. Woman, why weep us that? Mary. The least scary future I can think of is one where we have at least democratized AI. Because if one company or small group of people manages to develop godlike digital superintelligence, they could take over the world. Thank you for watching Bear Ministries.